Jamaica, the familiar image in the tourist posters. One of the jewels of the Caribbean, perfect beaches and everlasting sunshine. But that image is suffering today as political and economic forces paint another image in much starker colors. The graffiti upon the streets and me heavy fit through me a burden. Them said me set up this and arrange for that and talk, talk, talk and chat, chat, chat and nothing a change. Good evening. A week ago tonight, the home of an American diplomat in Jamaica was bombed and sprayed with machine gun fire. The diplomat, First Secretary Richard Kinsman, had been identified in an American magazine as a purported CIA agent. The Prime Minister of Jamaica, Michael Manley, apologized profusely for the incident and promised a rigorous investigation. The American was not hurt, but the incident symbolized both the political tension between the U.S. and Jamaica and the island's increasingly violent politics. So far this year, more than 250 Jamaicans have met violent deaths, most of them thought to be political murders. Prime Minister Manley has announced elections for later this year, but has given only a slim chance of holding power. The island's economy is staggering under rising energy prices and other troubles attributed to Manley's socialist economic policies. The island is heavily in debt to North American banks. In 1978, it secured large credits from the International Monetary Fund to finance recovery. But talks to refinance that broke down in March. Edward Siaga, the opposition leader, claims that Manley is taking the island down the road to Marxism. That anxiety is alive in Washington as the administration surveys the increasing political turmoil in the Caribbean as a breeding ground for Cuban or Soviet mischief. Tonight, a close-up view of Jamaica's dilemma and Manley's struggle to be both independent and solvent through the eyes of a British reporter, Bernard Falk. His filmed report was broadcast by the BBC two weeks ago. It begins last March as Manley travels to Grenada, the former British colony which set up a Marxist government friendly to Cuba after a revolution a year ago. In the uniform, Daniel Ortega, Sandinistan revolutionary from Nicaragua. In the tropical leisure suit, Michael Manley, Prime Minister of Jamaica. He's a self-appointed elder statesman of the third world, and as such is warmly greeted by comrade Prime Minister Maurice Bishop, who seized power in Grenada a year ago. All these men head countries greatly influenced and inspired by Fidel Castro's Cuba. This gathering will cause great alarm in the United States of America, proving the spirit of revolution is growing. But the presence of Michael Manley, hobnobbing with Marxist friends, will be even more provocative. Many Americans would like to be rid of Manley in the belief he's turning Jamaica into another Cuba. A comrade who has been consistent and principled in his anti-imperialist positions, in his support for poor, oppressed people fighting throughout the world. I want to introduce to you now, Comrade Prime Minister of Jamaica, Comrade Michael Manley. Manley's blame for caring more about third world ideology than about paying the rent. As far as his opponents are concerned, there's little doubt that Jamaica's problems stem from his admiration of Cuba. Manley is a close friend of Dr. Fidel Castro. After his first visit to Cuba, he praised the spirit of unity among the people and their ideology. It mattered little to Manley that in America, such support of a communist state was like a declaration of war. Mr. Manley's association with uh, Fidel Castro may be one of the prime reasons uh, that uh, many uh, bankers have turned down his request for the borrowing capacity for Jamaica, why their tourism is a low ebb, 
uh, why the economy is on the brink of disaster. Uh, these are the prices sometimes uh, people have to pay for their association with the wrong people. Today in Manly's Jamaica, the wrong people assert more influence than the United States, or anyone else for that matter. Ulysses Estrada, the Cuban ambassador, has the biggest diplomatic staff in the country. It's said he's a senior officer in the Cuban Secret Service and was trained by the KGB. Here, he's visiting a school being built by a large Cuban workforce. It's part of a massive aid program which includes hospitals, clinics and nurseries. The money comes from Cuba. Cuba, in her turn, is subsidized by the Soviet Union. There's no question in our mind, and we have been warning the country about this since 1975, and the country has now come more so to believe our view than the opposite view contended, that Manly's ultimate aim is to take Jamaica into the Cuban orbit and to transform the society into a Cuban-type society. They have, in fact, implemented many of the types of institutions that are necessary for the transformation. What sort of thing? training programs. We have, for instance, some 1,000 Jamaican youths that have now been trained in Cuba under a program that has come to be known as the Brigadista program. Because the purpose of the program is to set up Marxist-Leninist brigades to return to Jamaica to indoctrinate the peasant people and the working class people. The relationship with Cuba arises Partly because Cuba is our closest neighbor, partly because Jamaica has always had a, a friendship that is, is traditional, really. With Cuba, it goes back into the 19th century. We find that we both share a deep commitment to the liberation process. We take a similar view of, we took a similar view of Nicaragua. We take a similar view of South Africa. We took a similar view of Ian Smith. Do you take a similar view of America? Um, no, I don't think we take an, a, a, a similar view of America. I think they have, of course, a very um, unusual and painful experience. Do you think that your support of uh, Dr. Castro and a certain number of his causes, um, that having Cubans here, has helped to antagonize the United States towards Jamaica? Well, first of all, I've never supported Dr. Castro and his causes. I've discovered points where we have similar causes. We share causes. I don't support his causes, nor he mine for that matter. But that the relationship has contributed to and been the cause of strain with the United States, of that there's no question. It's a matter of principle. Why did you do it? I, I mean, because it is a matter of principle. Because to me it is an absolute matter of principle and it isn't negotiable and it will never be no matter what price is paid. It is not negotiable for me to believe that a small country has to determine its policy by reference to what some powerful neighbor feels. Comrades, all I can say, the international community has been run by the big powers for hundreds of years, and where are we? Where are we? Upsetting Jamaica's powerful neighbor seems to have been a manly speciality. When he came to power in 1972, he moved into head-on conflict with the interests of American big business. Bauxite is big business. It's the raw material from which aluminium is made. It's only found in a handful of countries, and Jamaica has two billion tons of it. Before Manley came to power, the entire Jamaican bauxite industry was controlled by six North American companies. The country's greatest natural asset belonged to someone else. The Jamaicans received only a pittance in royalties, about $40 million a year. After they were elected, Manley's government began to negotiate with the bauxite companies and after fierce resistance began to buy into the industry, mainly by compulsory purchase. Two years later, Jamaica was paying for a 51% controlling interest and her revenue from bauxite had gone up to $200 million a year. That, that agreement creates a new and we believe historic partnership between the company and Jamaica. He also formed the International Bauxite Association, a producer's cartel similar to OPEC in the oil industry. It was to ensure that poor countries got the maximum revenue from one of their few natural resources. 
But more significantly, it was the first time that Manley, using his socialist principles, went into action against American huge corporations and won. This remembers that wherever imperialism works, the people must unite to defeat it. In the eyes of some Americans, Manley had also threatened the security of the United States. Aluminium is used to build warplanes and rockets, and control of bauxite now lies outside America. And then came even worse provocation, with Manley's announcement that in future Jamaica was to be a socialist state. They came along with a lot of uh, remarkable statements about uh, their socialism and so on and that they didn't want any wealthy people here and so on and that they were going to take over the commanding heights of the economy and they frightened away every foreign investor that we had and a lot of local investors at the same time why were they frightened in what way because they were threatened they were told that they were not the sort of people that were not wanted here uh, that jamaica was going to be a socialist country and that uh, the capitalist was no longer welcome uh, America was called a wicked imperialist capitalist nation and exploiter and the whole ambience of the place was very frightening to any kind of investment. The biggest deterioration in Jamaica's relations with the United States came in 1975 when Cuba sent in troops to help the Marxist MPLA in Angola Manley made a speech lending Castro support. And the freedom fighters of Africa and the forces of liberation in Africa, they know that even more important than the sum of money is the knowledge of the moral power of nations here in the Western Hemisphere standing behind them in their struggle on the continent of Africa. It got Kissinger extraordinarily angry. It did indeed. It did indeed, <laughs> as we knew to our cost. <laughs> what was the cost? The cost, well, I think that, uh, that they all played their part. You know, all of a sudden, all aid dried up in that year, and, you know, we began to feel all sorts of pressures of the kind we were just discussing. You know, the, de 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 destabilization technique really was quite masterly in 76. In the closing days of the Ford administration, Kissinger had become almost manic about um, obliterating Manley, getting rid of Manley. A year later, Jamaica held a general election, the most violent in the country's history. Manley's supporters shot it out with members of the JLP, the opposition party. It was murder and rioting on both sides. Manley won the election amidst claims and counterclaims that much of the violence was caused by an American plot to get rid of him, including help for his opponents by the CIA. There is no question that there was a, a sustained and painfully effective destabilization process to which Jamaica was subject in the latter part of 1975 and increasingly in 1976. Can you just give me some examples of that? Yeah. The, for example, the things like this would happen. Um, there, it would be known that some famous syndicated columnist of the United States was going to come to spend a week resting in some villa. And mysteriously, the first night he's there, gunmen would arrive and start firing guns round and round his villa. Nobody would be hurt. By the next morning, he's in a state of terror. He flies home, and 79 newspapers across America read the story of the violent, terrible society disintegrating with gunmen the next morning. So you get the next few thousand tourist cancellations. That's the simplest example I can give. That happened. Um, another technique, for instance, is if you have a predisposition, as in Jamaica, to ghetto gang warfare, it's very easy to penetrate the gangs with Asian provocateur and stimulate them to really create mayhem. Are you saying the CIA was operating here? The, our impression is that the CIA had a hand in what happened in 1976. In that what was way? our information. Well, in the way, for instance, that they would have done in Chile. Nobody denies it in Chile. It's always denied in Jamaica. Mr. Manley told me that he thought there was a deliberate 
policy of destabilization uh, from the United States to get rid of him? Well, I hope that that makes better politics in Jamaica than it makes sense with regard to the United States. It's not true. It's not true. The, there's no doubt that, that elements of the United States system were involved in 1976. They denied, and I hear their denial, and I have said often that I'm not satisfied with denial because all our information is that they were involved in 1976. I must say that since the Carter administration, there is no evidence of any overt hostility towards Jamaica. There's no evidence of that. There is great hostility among certain elements of their system. You'll find elements in their Congress that are hostile about Jamaica as this friend of Cuba and non-aligned country and third world business, you know, and all this. All this happens. And certainly that has had a tremendous effect on investment. It has slowed down investment and we paid high prices. Manley believes the highest price he's had to pay is the collapse of the Jamaican economy. This is Kingston International Airport, and the conveyor belt transporting luggage looks like a mobile supermarket. Domestic goods unobtainable here are brought in by passengers from North America. Without foreign exchange, Jamaica is running out of the basic commodities people need to live. What things are you short of here? Um, the basic commodities, rice, flour, codfish, oil, bread. No bread? No bread. Is this a typical day? Yes, it's a typical day. Why can't you get the things? Well, it's all due to the economic situation in the country. We haven't got any foreign exchange. Since 1972, we have had seven negative years of growth. The only country in the world. There's no other country in the world that has that record. Since 1972, our reserves have plunged from $157 million to minus $600 million. Wow. We have a record in the world that no other country has. When a country goes broke, its people go broke with it. Unemployment is now around 30%, and factories are closing down daily. At this plastics factory, workers have been laid off, and half the remaining workforce sits idle, the machines covered up. Without foreign exchange, the company cannot import raw materials. The Bank of Jamaica is broke, 130 million pounds in debt. On the walls of Kingston, Manley's opponents know where to put the blame. IMF is Manley fault. Senior Albertelli, a banker with the International Monetary Fund, came to Jamaica to negotiate a small loan on top of the one billion dollars the country already owes. He demanded an end to ambitious socialist programs the country couldn't afford. Manley and his party, widely blamed for gross economic mismanagement, refused to accept dramatic government spending cuts. Now the talks have broken down, Jamaica is all but bankrupt. The biggest loss Jamaica has suffered has been the drain of people, the desertion from their homes in the Kingston suburbs of the vital middle class. They're mainly living in America, their houses empty or rented out. This is a banana plantation. It's owned by a family who've been in Jamaica since the 17th century, representatives of the old Jamaica of British colonial days. When Manley was returned to power in 1976, Morris Cargill, like thousands of others, sold up and moved away. Significantly, it was not to Britain that he chose to emigrate. But like everyone else nowadays, he went to the United States. Now, for better or worse, he's decided to try again. About 50,000 people a year have been leaving Jamaica since 1970. What are they escaping from? Uh, they're escaping from what they regard as a, a, a potentially communist situation. And they're escaping from uh, the shortages that have been occurring as a result of the spiraling down of our economy. So that people of all classes have been leaving Jamaica. Uh, not only doctors, lawyers, entrepreneurs, managers, and so on,
but the vast majority of them have been artisans, craftsmen, the, the most productive people of this country. After the political violence in the last election, the tourist trade collapsed. Americans are coming back now, but they don't wander far from the holiday hotels, the private beaches and the pursuit of their own pastimes. Jamaica's got the reputation of being unsafe, particularly for Americans. I've had Americans who, who, who called me from the United States and said, should I come down here? I hear bad things about Jamaica. It's anti-American. Fighting a rearguard action to improve relations between the two countries are members of the Jamaican America Friendly Society. They're waiting for the day Manley's removed, and right now they're very active indeed. That's because Manley's announced there'll be a general election before the end of the year. These people, and powerful politicians in America, can hardly wait for him to lose it. I feel that, uh, as many others do, that uh, Mr. Manley may have a tough time surviving the next election, if indeed uh, there is an election. Would it suit American interests if he didn't survive the next uh, election? Well, based on his uh, current reaction to the American government, uh, I feel that it would probably would be in the best interest if uh, someone other than Mr. Manley uh, were in a position to uh, govern uh, the country of Jamaica. American support is solidly behind Manley's opponent, Edward Siaga. On the streets of Kingston, they have their own way of spelling it. The railway line runs through a slum in the middle of Kingston. This is Manley's power base. Ironically, his supporters have suffered more than any from the collapse of Jamaica's economy. Once they had very little, now they've nothing at all. Yet they're fiercely loyal to the man regarded by the poor as a savior. What would you do for Michael Manley? For Michael Manley? Yeah. I would have moved the world for Michael Manley, for the people's man. Yeah. Him see the people, him see the struggle of the people. Go off fight the last man. Go off for the people, all the white people. Go off for the people, all the way. Go off for the people, all the way. But for all his popular acclaim, Manley's election chances are looking slim. That doesn't hurt the interests of his American critics still trying to discredit him and suggesting that he might move irrevocably to the left. It's very possible uh, that uh, Jamaica may become a totalitarian state or attempt to do so. Uh, I found that politically the highest priority in any government is self-preservation of the politician and if Mr. Manley's eyes he is not capable of re-election uh, the first sign will be a delay of the election and possibly a cancellation of any elective process. He's campaigning now. I mean, he said there's going to be an election. Well, uh, that's entirely possible, but uh, if polls begin to indicate that uh, the electorate does not agree with the politician that's campaigning, and, and he's in a position of power to uh, cancel or uh, uh, delay elections, then it's within the realm of possibility that election may not hit be held. It's been said to me that if you win the next election, because you have Marxists very powerful in your own in your own party, that that's the first major step towards you creating Jamaica into a totalitarian one-party state. People have said that to me. They said that before 1972. They said it before 1976. They said it before my father won his first election in 1955. They said it before the election that he lost in 49. They said it before the election that he lost in 44. They said it before the election that he lost in 67. They will go on saying it to the end of time. It's good politics to say it. It's a lie. Has it ever occurred to you? No, it has never occurred to me. It's just not relevant to the Jamaican situation. You have Marxists in your own party. Say you left the political scene your party would then be firmly in the hands of committed Marxists. No, this is a, you know, this, you, you said this term, I heard you say that before, and I, I didn't want to be rude and interrupt you, uh, about powerful Marxists in the party. What does one mean by that? I mean, I read Marx and think Marx is one of the most important thinkers in, in world history. Does that make me a Marxist in the sense in which you use the term? 
You have Marxists or, in your party who exercise enormous amounts of There are a lot of people, of a lot of people who have read Marx, admire Marx, and think a lot of the Marxist analysis is relevant. But if by Marxist you mean communist, the answer is no. A member of the junta of reconstruction of the people and government of Nicaragua. Manley's problem has been recognizing that idealism doesn't pay the rent. He's not afraid to be seen as an intimate of Marxist revolutionaries. But they don't have to fight an election. In their countries, democracies don't exist. Manley's never cared about the effects scenes like this have on American opinion. If the United States did destabilize him, then this is how he encouraged America to do it. To me, it's just, there's just no point to the world if everybody is going to have to compromise every principle they believe in merely because some big neighbor might get vexed. The reporter in that film was Bernard Falk of the BBC. Since his report was completed, the economic situation has begun to ease slightly with supplies of food and other imports improving. Jamaica is arranging further loans from other countries, but U.S. investors remain cautious until after the election. The latest polls give Mr. Manley's opponents a 16% lead. That's all for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow night. I'm Robert McNeil. Good night. <laughs>